Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. We're just going to give it a few minutes uh, so that uh, other people who are still joining can before we start our session. Whilst we are doing so, let us know in one word how you're feeling today. In one word, uh, please kindly use the chat box. Okay, uh, I can see the chat box is already busy. Uh, most of you are excited, just like me. <laughs> and someone is curious, uh, and someone is great, that's okay, motivated. If I could say two, of course, I would have said motivated as well. Uh, and someone from Uganda is bought, uh, excited, uh, hypocritical, super, um, yeah. This is uh, all amazing uh, coming through the chat box and thank you so much for joining in. We just want to welcome you all to this uh, amazing discussion that has been uh, prepared and planned uh, so that we can get to learn and hear from uh, one uh, from uh, the participants uh, from the Year for Climate. So just want to say when we shared the registration link, uh, we didn't expect such an amazing, amazing, uh, you know, uh, attendance. A, a lot of people managed to register and uh, we actually reached our maximum registration. So in case there are people who wanted to be in the webinar and could not, please let them know that the session will be recorded and will be shared on our Youth for Climate platform. So we are not leaving anyone behind. So this webinar is the first in a series convened by the Youth for Climate Initiative led by the United Nations Development Program and the government of Italy. I'm sure you have heard about Youth for Climate. Those who have not heard about it, uh, we do have a website. You can check us out and you can also uh, take a look at some of the initiatives that the Youth for Climate has done in the previous years. So the main purpose or the aim of Youth for Climate is to identify amplify and support and scale youth-led climate uh, initiatives. I'm going to expand that in a bit. Um, it is important to understand that the first Youth for Climate call for solution in 2023 sourced over 1,100 youth-led solutions, which is really amazing because you can just get to see how passionate and determined young people are. And you can imagine that from 1,100 young people, uh, we only needed like 50 people. But not saying that, you know, the 1,100 uh, solutions uh, that, that, you know, the ex that the people that expressed, they were not important. All ideas were really important. So uh, we just encourage you all to, you know, keep an eye for, you know, for more opportunities that will be shared. So definitely amongst the 1,100, uh, we were mainly focusing on climate education, energy, food and agriculture and urban sustainability. And as I mentioned, 50 young people across 39 countries uh, managed to get 20,000 US dollars each to amplify and upscale the work that they are doing. Could it be in organic waste, climate literacy, nature-based solutions, solar energy, you can name it all. So this webinar series, which will take place monthly, aims to spotlight each of these uh, initiatives. And this will also save us a space to learn and reflect among young innovators working on solving similar challenges across the world. The series is titled In Our Shoes, Learning with Youth Climate Innovators. You can only imagine, this is amazing because in our shoes, we get the opportunity to hear their experiences, to hear the challenges, 
to hear how they are engaging and how they are upscaling their work. So because young people are paving the way and leading change in their communities and because there's so much to learn from their experiences and daily challenges, we saw it fit to have this or to create this platform so that we can engage more. So to make sure we capture a broad range of experiences beyond those of the innovators, I am sure you're also going to hear directly um, online uh, from, from them, of course, and we're going to encourage you to contribute as well. So it's not a matter of listening, but it's a matter of you contributing because we believe you're also doing amazing initiatives wherever you're joining us from. So this serves as a cross-sharing platform uh, for everyone. We have already captured 80 contributions on clean cooking. 80, imagine 80, this was a discussion that took place on the Youth for Climate platform. If you are not part of it, please uh, join in uh, or you can follow the link that will be shared in the chat box and get to be part of the conversation that will be taking place throughout the year. And the insights in the webinar on the online discussions uh, will be captured into a brief uh, report, which will be shared with all of you so that you can also share with your colleagues and friend. So before diving into today's topic, I would also want to uh, mention that the new, I cannot say new, but I, I want to mention that we have also already opened up a call for the Youth for Climate in case you might have missed it last year. There is an opportunity for you. Like I said, I'm going to share more information. So there is a chance actually, and the call is already open. What you need is to just apply. And before you apply, just a tip. Uh, since we also do have some of the awards that will be speaking to us today, it will be good to take notes from them or to engage with them bilaterally and ask them how they, you know, how they did their applications. Also, uh, they, they are also videos on the Youth for Climate platform, which will also teach you or rather assist you in making your application the best application. And just to conclude by saying you can apply in English, French, Spanish for a funding up to 30,000. We have upscaled it because we are know and we are aware that you're doing amazing initiatives and 20,000 was not enough. So I have said enough and we now want to get into serious business. Um, this webinar series is looking into clean cooking initiatives. Definitely, you know that there is extensive land degradation through tree cutting and this uh, massive land degradation is also contributing to the use of, um, uh, it's also contributed to, to greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and unsustainable cooking practices. Uh, they also do contribute to that. But just to mention that fortunately through innovative ideas, and we are going to hear from young people who have joined us, uh, they have managed to come up with different innovations that will tackle and ensure that People, when they are cooking, it's a safe space, it's in a healthy way, and also it's also healthy for our planet. So without further ado, I am going to call upon someone who has been really active in this space, an expert in the field. Uh, her bio is really interesting, uh, and her name is Chibululuo who is the Global Energy and Chain Climate Change Advisor, uh, UNDP Sustainable Energy Hub and Climate Hub. Uh, Jibulu Luo, uh, also known as Lulu, serves as the Global Energy and Climate Change Advisor, as mentioned before, and she possesses over eight years of program management and analytical experience in the energy sector. And she also uh, has uh, vast experience in energy modeling and GAG emissions. Uh, prior to joining UNDP, Lulu held a position as an energy and climate change expert at global development institutions such as the Climate Investment Fund, which is SPIF, if you want to call it, the International Finance Corporation, IFC, and also the Global Environmental Facility. We are so honored to have uh, Lulu amongst us. 
She also holds a master's in engineering management from Duke University and also a master of mechanical engineering. So I, I'm sure this is going to be really interesting to hear from her considering the experience that she has. Lulu, I'm just gonna give this platform to you so that you can share with us uh, a few remarks before we embark uh, on our session with our amazing uh, Youth for Climate Awards. Over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you might be joining us. Um, thank you for joining this pivotal discussion on clean cooking on this Youth Cook for Climate in Her Shoes webinar. Uh, very excited to shine the, the, the spotlight on the trailblazing efforts of young innovators that are reshaping the landscape on clean cooking. Uh, clean cooking has been an area of energy access that has been left out of the discourse for, for far too long. But to unlock the full potential of SDG 7, ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all, we need to address every dimension of energy access, especially clean cooking. Um, so as we're all too aware, the, the oops, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I got, got a little bit confused there with the screen change. Okay, so um, you can just go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as, as you're aware, you know, the, the, the advances in uh, clean cooking access are moving uh, extremely slow with some countries experiencing a reversal in trends, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, global data actually tells us that there's a staggering 2.3 billion people without access to clean cooking, 900 million of those in sub-Saharan Africa. And without accelerated action, 1.9 billion people can be expected to remain in cooking poverty by 2030. If this were to happen, this would result in an annual cost of $2.4 trillion due to the negative impacts on health, gender, and climate. And so the integrated nature of the clean cooking transition is so important, um, not just as an energy issue, but really a core part of global development. Women in particular bear the brunt of cooking uh, polluting uh, fuels and uh, solutions because social and cultural norms often dictate that women are the ones that are supposed to collect the firewood that are supposed to cook in the home. Um, and so we're, you know, one of the things that we as UNDP are trying to do is really try to dismantle this and really um, shift the, the cultural and societal um, biases and discriminations that really prohibit women from really um, advancing in terms of their own economic development and livelihood. And so really excited to hear about the solutions that you know, will be presented today and really how some of these considerations are, are, are being taken into account. So um, just uh, go over to the next slide, please. So, so now let me reflect a little bit more about UNDP's work and approach. Um, UNDP has been at the forefront of clean cooking initiatives for several decades and we embed um, clean cooking as part of our broader energy, climate, and environmental programming. Um, our mission is quite simple, to really ensure that no one is left behind in the energy transition. And so this means that we support all cooking technologies that really shift households, businesses, and institutions away from these traditional polluting fuels. And so we're really looking at the entire spectrum of solutions from improved biomass cook stoves to LPG stoves, you know, ethanol, biogas, and even electric cooking, um, because we really understand that every country context is quite different, um, and you can't impose a specific solution to, to a community. Um, and so I'd like to end off by spotlighting three areas that would be really important to driving the cooking transition that UNDP is really pushing, um, and where we see the contribution of young people being very important. Um, the first is really building sustainable cooking value chains. Um, so really shifting the focus from not just only the technology or the process of deploying that technology, but really looking at an integrated solution space where you're looking at the delivery models, the value chains, the social cultural context, looking at ways to ensure that you're promoting you know, more productive uses of clean cooking, and really how are we engaging women as, as key agents of change in this transition. The second is really um, understanding, you know, how are we looking at consumer preferences, um, everyday re realities of communities, and considering this into the design and deployment of technologies. 
Um, and so there's a lot around, for example, digital innovations, you know, in terms of how we're tracking and understanding community behavior or even innovations in how we uh, promote um, pay payment of many of these technologies, for example. And then the final piece is really having that development lens as we design programming. So basically not looking at clean cooking as a siloed sector within the energy space, but making sure that we're embedding solutions as part of nature-based solutions, as part of biodiversity e efforts, urban planning, adaptation and crisis response. Um, and so really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, and I think each of these areas that I've just mentioned would really benefit from the contributions of all of you that are, uh, that are working in this space. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Lulu, that was so insightful. I liked it when you said women are mainly referred to the end users of uh of of energy like uh you know when you the women they are identified with collecting firewood but not really incorporating into the all uh, energy renewable energy value chain thank you so much for those insights and we are just happy that you'll be with us throughout the discussions and uh, we will learn a lot from your expertise so we are going to move on to uh, grace Grace is the senior assistant programs uh, from a sustainable energy for all, C for all, if you want to, uh, to shorten it. And um, she supports all Rwanda programs, uh, some other projects under the policy and regulatory frameworks uh, team. And also, uh, Grace, she has a, a, a lot of experience in the space, uh, though, uh, I mean, she has five years of experience. And also just to mention that uh, she also has one year of experience working at the Economic Regulation, regulation Unit uh, of Rwanda. Uh, she has also engaged with the uh, Plan International Rwanda uh, EIPA, Innovation for Poverty Action, and as SCI Save the Children International Rwanda. Grace holds a master's degree in energy economics and bachelor's degree in agriculture. Grace, in case there's something that I might have left on your bio, I'm going to give you the platform to uh, share your remarks. And yeah, the platform is uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And hi, everyone. Um, you've left nothing. <laughs> So I think you uh, talked about it all. So um, it's both an honor and a privilege to speak to you all today at this Clean Cooking webinar. As Elizabeth said, I work at SE for All as a senior assistant for Randa programs, but also supporting the Clean Cooking team and the Policy Regulatory Frameworks team. So for those who don't know Sustainable Energy for All, it's an international organization dedicated to delivering faster action towards achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7. Our mission is deeply aligned with the Paris Agreement on Climate, and we work in close partnership with the United Nations governments, private sector, financial institutions, civil society, and philanthropies. At SE for All, we believe in a clean energy transition that leaves no one behind and creates new opportunities for all individuals to fulfill their potential. So now for our clean cooking program, our program, our clean cooking program aims to place clean cooking at the forefront of the global energy and climate agenda by supporting countries in planning for an accelerated transition and unlocking finance for the sector. We strive to create and transform markets, generate jobs, and foster business opportunities within the clean cooking sector. Our approach revolves around four main pillars. One is raising ambition and partnerships. So we work to build the action base through high-level agenda settings, partnerships, and convenings. This involves supporting countries to prioritize clean cooking, establishing strategic partnerships and convening stakeholders globally to spotlight opportunities for action. Two, um, we do data and knowledge for decision-making. 
We elevate the importance of clean cooking in national energy planning and improve data and evidence bases to accelerate decision-making within the sector. The third pillar is unlocking finance and, and country action. So we leverage innovative finance mechanisms to scale finance towards the clean cooking sector. For example, in Tanzania, we have partnered with WFP, World Food Program, to design a clean cooking platform for schools with an innovative carbon finance component. Additionally, we emphasize awareness and adoption by seeking opportunities to elevate clean cooking, engage women and youth sector, and raise awareness through innovative communication strategies. In addition to those four pillars, we mainstream gender and youth across all our programs. As an example, we have the Women in Clean Cooking Mentorship Program, which provides mentorship and professional development for women in early and mid management positions, entrepreneurs and other work others working in the clean cooking ecosystem. We implement this program in partnership with CCA, the Cooking Alliance and DWNet. Now narrowing down to Rwanda, some projects have been implemented on ground in collaboration with our integrated energy planning team and the MIT and IIT researchers. The clean cooking team is supporting the development of the National Integrated Clean Cooking Plan and its associated tool in Rwanda. Another project um, has been implemented in, in collaboration with the government of Rwanda and the Clean Cooking Alliance, where we recently organized a comprehensive clean cooking training program. A total of 44 individuals were empowered through sessions covering pivotal topics such as clean cooking finance, carbon markets, and the national to inform you uh, we have done an electric pressure cooker pilot study here in Rwanda to examine the potential for electric cooking in Rwanda. This study was published in August last year and it's available on our website for exploration if you may want to. In conclusion, uh, sustainable energy development, sustainable energy for all clean cooking programs, sorry is committed to driving tangible progress towards achieving sustainable development goal seven and fostering a clean, a clean energy transition that benefits all. We believe that together we can make a significant difference and ensure universal access to clean cooking. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to a fruitful discussion during this webinar. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Grace, for sharing the insights and also the initiatives that uh, C4O is doing. Uh, we just want to thank you for accepting our invitation. And we know you'll be with us throughout this whole session to add more information. And yeah. So as I mentioned in my introduction, we had an amazing discussion where we're discussing about clean cooking initiatives and some of the challenges I'm just going to quote from one of the um, an active particip uh, participant who joined our discussions um, from Gay. When we asked about the challenges, what he what Gay says is the challenges in implementing clean cooking initiatives can include the high initial cost of clean technologies, lack of public awareness of the benefits of clean cooking and barriers related to availability and availability accessibility of the resources necessary to implement these sustainable practices. This is what Gay says, but we would also want to hear what you think about this. Uh, we are going to run a poll. We want to understand what do you think is the biggest clean cooking challenge in your country? Uh, Gay said uh, what I have shared but we also had quite a number of people who shared what they, what you know, or their challenges in their country. But all that information is really not enough because some of you were not part of that discussion. So we want to hear from you. What is the biggest challenge? Uh, what is the biggest clean cooking challenge in your country? Please feel free to use the chat box 
And um, yeah, I shall be reading out your comments uh, whenever we get the opportunity. But yeah, I hope the link has been shared uh, and I hope you are already responding. Let me know if you can see uh, the poll. Just let me know through the chat box if you can see the poll so that we don't leave anyone behind in this important discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Abdallah, for confirming. Yes, uh, so people are responding to the poll. That's good. So on the poll, we have availability of devices, um, affordability, awareness, and behavior. So we want to hear from you. The biggest clean cooking challenge in your country. I'm sure we are going to share the results later, but as we do that, we are going to proceed with our session. And I would want to introduce to you to our first panel uh, on this topic of innovate, innovation in, in clean cooking. So I'm going to, I'm sure you can see the results already, if I'm not mistaken. I thought I could see them uh, on my screen. Yes, uh, okay, we can see, I can, at least I can see the results. So from the results, we have availability of devices, which is 16%. Uh, and most people have indicated affordability, which is uh, at 45%, awareness, 33%, and behavior, 6%. Thank you so much for participating in this poll. Uh, it's actually going to help us in, you know, uh, uh, coming up with a well-detailed report after this session. Thank you so much. So as I'm going to call out uh, my panel, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to give a, a brief description on who is going to be joining us. So we are going to hear, I'm just going to give a brief description, then we will give them a, an opportunity uh, to respond to a few questions. So on our panel, we will have uh, Thomas uh, from uh, Chile. Uh, and Thomas uh, has an organization called uh, Echo uh, Table. And Thomas uh, is into clean cooking and heating. And uh, he has also managed to develop a technology that minimizes and particulate emissions from wood stoves and it also reduces fuel consumption up to 50%. It's actually an honor to have Thomas in the house. Then the next person I'm going to introduce is um, Cedric. Uh, if uh, Cedric is here, uh, Cedric is also into clean cooking initiatives and they devised an environmentally friendly call from agriculture waste that is, uh, you know, agriculture waste most of the times it's mainly thrown away, but they came up with uh, an, an initiative and an innovative idea to make use of agricultural waste. Then Oma is into uh, clean cooking initiatives through a biogas. So these are the people that we are going to hear from today. Uh, I'll just check if they are all here. Yes, they are. So Thomas, we're going to uh, start with you actually. Um, and from you, Thomas, I think we would want to hear about the technology that you developed that minimizes particulate emissions from wood stoves. What was the drive behind this technology? And what challenges did you face when coming up with this technology? So it would be good to hear from you. If you are here, please uh, kindly unmute and share with us your insights. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, our EcoTurbo technology improves cooking practices by offering substantial benefits for the individual, but also the, the environment. Uh, it reduces particulate emission um, from wood stoves. It tackles air pollution, ensuring cleaner air for the community. 
And this innovative solution also enhances the heating efficiency. So it allows users to save up to 50% on fuel and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, the drive behind our development or technology uh, was to minimize particulate emission from wood stoves um, because in our hometown, they, they implemented, implemented measuring devices to know exactly how much particular matter was emitted by uh, the population. And it, it was through the roof. Uh, as traditional wood stove are, are a common source of pollution and it, uh, addressing this issue was imperative for us. Um, Raising awareness was uh, among uh, consumers and policymakers presented a challenge uh, overcoming, uh, overcoming difficulties and demonstrating the benefits of our technology was also uh, a main effort for us because with all new technology, there is a skepticism. I don't know how to say it, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was really hard at, at first, but despite this challenge, the drive to address the, the pressing matter of uh, public health and uh, air pollution, it's what fueled our determination to to develop the, the, the Kotorbo technology. Thank you so much, Thomas, for that. So much appreciate. I think just a follow-up question. How is how is your community um, adopting your technology? Uh, you highlighted the challenges, but now uh, is there any improvement? Yeah, uh, we have worked with the government. Uh, we have uh, a, a program to, to adopt this technology. Um, in, in public spaces and also with the private sector. Uh, we have over 3000 users already. Uh, we started this, uh, this uh, technology or this uh, company about three years ago. So it's fairly new, but we have already 3000 users, over 3000 users all over Chile uh, with amazing results. Uh, the feedback from the users are great. Uh, they all always recommend the technology for, to relatives, to friends. Um, and yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much, Thomas, and congratulations to you, 3,000 users. That's really a lot. And thank you so much for playing your part in ensuring that we are living in a healthy planet and making sure that you know these technologies, they actually do uh, support healthy lifestyle and are quite efficient. We are going to move on to Cedric. Cedric, uh, I would want, or maybe would want to hear from you, why are you so passionate about agriculture? And uh, how can agricultural waste be a solution to climate change? Over to you, Cedric. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Cedric from Benin, West Africa. Uh, so, uh, firstly, I can say, I, I can say it is um, imperative to acknowledge that agriculture is a vital sector for the sustenance of humanity. Among those those persons here, we can personally claim that. Uh, we have never consumed an, any agricultural products uh, their until existence. Agricultural, like water, is life. So then um, my passion for agriculture has deepened with age as I gain an understanding of various agricultural phenomena and, uh, um, and um, I'll correct the numerous Daring challenges such as soil depletion, crops delay, and many other. This led me to enroll in agricultural university after completing my baccalaureate, aiming to better understand these phenomena and more important to explore solutions uh, they can uh, use to reduce agriculture 
a big challenge. So my university study, I have come to crops that agriculture is its own way contribute to gas, a greenhouse gas emission. One particular action I'm undertaking is a holistic approach to agricultural advisory service aiming to impacting good agroecological practice uh, through practical farmer to farmer training videos. For, for example, we give teaching traditional irrigation technique using plastic waste, uh, utilize human urine as organic fertilizer or producing insecticide from nymph leaf and another. Uh, another uh, thing, another notable aspect is the considerable amount of waste generated post harvest and uh, during agricultural processing. So we can, we have peanut shell, uh, corn husk, pineapple pulp and more are often deposited or uh, by burning or peeling up. So this emitting greenhouse gas and uh, contributing to air pollution. This, um, this issue has significantly captured my attention and uh, prompted deep reflection. It is during this, uh, this reflection that I identify a connection between agricultural waste and cooking energy, especially given uh, the challenging access to cooking energy in my community due to state restriction on forest exploitation. So uh, I realized that we could work on reducing and, and uh, on reducing and valorize agricultural waste to mitigate greenhouse gas emission. With agricultural waste, various possibility uh, emerge. You can use, uh, you can valorize uh, agricultural waste to make a uh, ecological calcul, biogas, compost, green, uh, hydrogen, and more. My particular experience uh, around ecological calcul, as I mentioned uh, early access to cooking energy present uh, as a real challenge in my community. Therefore, uh, the Green Biofuel project that we are initiating uh, are engaging in a circular approach. We collaborate with uh, farmer and female peanut processor uh, to collect agricultural waste such as peanut, uh, rice, husk, and other, which we then carbonize to produce ecological calcul. Uh, this calcul is sold to, is, to women for cooking uh, easily. So this initiative, uh, through this initiative, we contribute to reduce greenhouse gas emission from the incomplete combustion of uh, firewood and waste. We also contribute to the preservation of carbon sink and uh, preservation of our forests and more than uh, 1,000 plant and animal species, species facing extinction. Additionally, we can uh, we foster social stability by creating new jobs uh, via the valorization of agricultural waste and supporting the economic activity of female um, peanut processor. Uh, so uh, with agricultural waste, we can get money and save our planet so I, with us, I invite you to take uh, action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric. Uh, and I saw some people in the chat were saying, oh, Cedric, could you please put on your camera? They want to match the voice and the face, unfortunately, I think due to uh, network, um, it was uh, quite essential that at least we hear Okay, thank you so much, Cedric. At least people can can now see you. Um, but also, Cedric, I think in in a minute, uh, did you experience any challenges with coming up with this initiative? Yeah, the challenge of our initiative is like the uh, the resource for implementation of our ideas. Uh, firstly. Uh, our when we want to start the initiative, the 
community and most person don't believe uh, that we can use uh, agricultural waste to make clean uh, energy. So we don't have uh, the support for 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 project. But after the prototype step and um, the uh, we can say the um, the testimony after the the the, the prototype stage stay and testimony we have uh, the addition of the community but now the a big challenge is um the resource and we can thank uh UNDP who like like uh, we, we can thank UNDP who give us um this opportunity to win prize to implement uh, this project Thank you, thank you so much, Omar. Oh, yes, we do thank uh, the UNDP and the government of Italy for providing resources for young people to upscale their initiative and also to address uh, their challenges. Now, next, we're going to hear from Omar. He's from uh, Yemen. And Omar, we want to hear your perspective. What makes biogas an alternative option? And why should people embrace the use of biogas? Over to you, Omar, if you are here. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, having me in this uh, uh, great panel and thank you for all attendees. Uh, biogas actually uh, offers several uh, advantages that makes this uh, fuel uh, a good alternative for traditional fuels. Um, I can mention some points that are, uh, make this uh, one of the best options for clean cooking or another purpose of energy. Uh, the first uh, advantage is the biogas is a renewable source. Biogas is produced from organic waste, uh, from uh, food scraps or from uh, animal manure or sewage. So that means uh, those things are produced daily and uh, it's a sustainable sources, unlike other uh, fossil fuels. So it's a, a renewable and sustainable source of energy. Uh, the other advantage is uh, it reduces the waste and pollution because we are uh working on treating this waste and uh, uh, creating fuel from this treatment so we are uh, solve this uh, two problems in, in in our own way so we are solving the waste problem from um uh catching wastes uh, organic wastes or from uh, uh, other farm wastes and we use it as a solution for another problem which is the access to clean cooking so uh, we can uh, solve the improper waste management especially organic waste management by creating a uh, value for this uh, for this uh, waste uh, by producing biogas uh, and also uh, it uh, helps to reduce the organic waste that goes to the landfills and reduce the methane emissions and protect the environment from the greenhouse gas. As we know, the methane is uh, uh, 40 times uh, 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 dangerous than the CO2 for the uh, global warming. The another thing is the, the clean burning fuel. The methane is the main uh, component of the biogas, and we can burn in it, and it, it, it's a, a cleaner compared to another fuels. It's cleaner than LPG. So this is one of the advantage that makes the biogas one of the uh, great alternative for the for the cooking. One of the most uh, important uh, points that uh, helping and uh, uh, making the biogas one of the best uh, options is the energy independence. 
especially in the small scale. So, uh, so biogas can be produced locally in a, in a home level, in a small biogas plants, even in a small farms or in some uh, centralized uh, plants. So this technology can be produced and the biogas can be produced in many levels. So that makes it it's a available fuel. And uh, that's what we are working in, in Yemen because we are working with a small hold farmers and also rural farmers and the the value chain of the of the of the small scale biogas plants appears clearly in the rural areas so uh, if, uh, we we developed a small scale bio, portable biogas plant uh, inside of uh, 1.8 uh, cubic meters it can uh, secure about uh, uh, three hours of clean cooking gas, and that's uh, the needs meets the needs of a small family consisting from five to six uh, to seven uh, members. Also, uh, it saves the money. So uh, the estimated amount of cost uh, of savings from for cooking is about seventy to eighty percent per year. Uh, and promote the gender equality because we know in most of uh, areas as um, our uh, first guest today speak, uh, speaks that uh, most of people don't have access to clean cooking energy in Yemen and many uh, developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So the, the women and children are the responsible ones who are collecting firewood to use it as a um, as a fuel for for cooking, so we uh, the biogas can help uh, on uh, on uh, on stopping this uh, this thing is that uh, uh, that require a lot of work by women and and children and uh, they can escape from their schools. Uh, also, one important thing that in the biogas technology that it's 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 uh, uh, help uh, on the promotion of circular economy because we 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 treat the organic waste uh, even from kitchen or from animal money or from the or from the farm waste and we can get two products the first one is biogas and is used for cleaning and the second product is fertilizer so the biogas technology is helping and getting uh, the community in the circular economy and making value for the for the for the for the waste uh, in two ways in cleaning and clean cooking gas also on uh, high quality uh, organic fertilizers so that thing is makes it uh, one of the best options for for people especially in the rural areas and small hold for uh, our small hold farmers in Yemen and many different countries. Thank you so much, Omar, for getting into much detail. I had a follow-up question, but you actually responded to it, so I no longer have a follow-up question. So um, I'm going to ask our audience to post their questions in the chat, but whilst you're doing so, I just want to reflect back to the discussions that we had on the Y4C platform. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear from uh, Esther Wadza. Esther is from Kenya, and Esther highlighted on the platform that she founded um, Pito Energy in 2022. And up to date, she has managed to empower um, um, different women in Kenya and also uh, up to 300 women in Kenya have also uh, you know, uh, had the experience uh, of using uh, clean cooking uh, methods and have actually you know, um, uh, got the opportunity to use uh, the technology that she created. We had so many, so many different examples. Uh, and also uh, Jessica uh, also highlighted the importance of, you know, agricultural waste as uh, you also have mentioned, uh, one of our panelists has also mentioned, and also on biogas. She also says that biogas is an alternative option for clean cooking. Uh, because of its renewable nature. I think you just mentioned it. And um, 
she says it is produced from organic waste uh, through anaerobic digestion, offering cleaner and sustainable energy sources and embracing biogas helps in reducing reliance on traditional fuels and contributes to mitigating environmental impacts. You have added all these discussions, they happen on the Youth for Climate platform. And um, please, if you have time, uh, go to the platform, uh, take a look and also add in your inputs. We are going to run a poll uh, because we want to hear from you if you are working on any of the following clean cooking solutions. Uh, in case you didn't manage to join the online discussions, uh, but you are in this meeting today, we still want to hear from you. So a link is going to be shared. Uh, it has or the poll is already running. Uh, so we have improved uh, cooking stove, biogas, liquefied petroleum gas, electric cooking, ethanol. The question is, are you working on any of the following clean cooking solutions. So let us know what you're working on. Whilst we are waiting for uh, the poll, I'm just going to check if we do have questions in the chat box. Um, Yes, we do, uh, from uh, Daniel. And Daniel is saying, could you kindly provide me with the contacts of websites of your organizations or the NGOs involved in this sector so that I can gather more information and perhaps contribute in some way? Thank you so much, Daniel. And definitely, I think it's, uh, it's possible uh, to our panelist, uh, Omar, uh, Cedric, if you are and Thomas, if you are comfortable, please uh, kindly share your organization's uh, details or your website so that people can follow you, including your social media platforms as well. So the results are out. Uh, we have improved cooking stove at fifty three percent, then biogas at forty three percent liquefied petroleum gas at 10%, electric cooking at 15%, and last but not least, ethanol at 10%. So based on the poll, improved cooking stoves is what uh, people are used to at 53%. Thank you so much for your participation. Much appreciate. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Uh, so I'm just going to call upon Lulu and Grace if you're here in case you do have any remarks uh, on what uh, Omar, Cedric, and Thomas have shared. Yes. Um, and, uh, thank you so much, um, Thomas, Cedric, and Omar for your insights. Um, it just shows kind of the the range of technologies that are needed to advance on on this space. Um, and just maybe to re reflect on Thomas's innovation um, on the biomass solution, um, you know, it really speaks to you know improved biomass cooking as a very credible option for communities. Um, you know, when you look at the technology compared to maybe biogas um, or even electric cooking, certainly the contribution of these stoves towards a, a net zero you know cooking transition when we talk about kind of the global energy narrative you know the biomass stove perhaps is not as effective but um you know very much an, an important technology for rural communities um particularly given um the affordability of the solution so thank you so much for highlighting that um i think also it was interesting to hear from you cedric in terms of how you're working across the different systems. So working in the agricultural sector and then addressing the food, you know, in, in many ways also addressing the food security issues and then energy. Um, and so, you know, speaking again to kind of this, this need for an integrated approach to the solution. And this is something that we definitely support um, as UNDP and many of our kind of clean cooking um, innovations are also embedded, embedded in a similar way um, that you describe. Um, I think what we need to see perhaps to 2030, 
um, you know, or even 2050, as we shift towards a, a, a clean energy transition, is that we need to see these solutions being the primary solution of choice when it comes to cooking. What you see in many communities is that there is a lot of fuel stacking and the fuel stacking is happening with these clean solutions, but then also with the open fire burning or the open fire charcoal use. And so if we can promote you know, a gradual shift towards these solutions so that no one is using these traditional sources, I think that's what um, we would want to promote. The final point that I was also thinking about as I was hearing from everybody is that we need to have kind of a different narrative when we think about clean cooking. It's not just a household issue. I would also argue it's not perhaps an institutional issue, but we need to really pr promote a more productive um, use, um, in you know, look at how we can have more productive uses of clean cooking. So making sure that, you know, we're promoting clean cooking, even like in market activities or other types of activities within the community um, to really kind of shift the narrative that it's not just, you know, from, from kind of a, a single point, it's really kind of an integrated um, solution space. So just a few thoughts. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Lulu. Before we move on to Grace, I think there's also a question from Godwin. I'm so sorry I had missed that one. And Godwin is saying, how could OMA and GNDP promote new techniques of constructing biodigesters? For example, beyond producing biogas, I am told the slurry is good for products such as liquid soap and ready to use uh, humus for vegetable production. We want practical skills in action. What is UNDP and OMA's way forward? Uh, OMA, is this something that you would want to respond uh, or via chat? Uh, thank you so much, Godwin, for that. I think also just to add on that, uh, I'm glad that uh, OMA is working on this. And I mean, the, the space is quite diverse, right? So if someone uh, starts an, an initiative or an, innovate, an innovation, uh, it's always good to have people that are also complementing uh, on the innovation. So Omar, please let me know if you would want to respond to um, to the techniques of constructing biodigesters. We have unfortunately lost uh, Omar due to his connection, Elizabeth. Okay, I'm so sorry, uh, Godwin. We are going to send your question to Omar. Uh, and I'm sure he will be able to respond and share the response with you. So Grace, uh, over to you to share your reflections if you want to. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you panelists for all the insights you've shared. Um, so Chibulu has uh, reflected on many of the things. So I will just speak about the biogas and um, the poll, which asked actually the most challenging problem within countries. Um, so when I think of biogas here in Rwanda, uh, most of the biogas systems has failed. It's actually a good project, but um, it's like many people don't own, like we love this thing of ownership so whenever these systems are built some of the people um like the owners the households don't own the systems and they end up failing so um this comes with the uh, maintenance of the systems so i would suggest that uh, people working in the biomass sector sorry biogas sector if you can um always think of maintenance of these systems and try to let these people whom you give systems own the systems and try to teach them the, the ways they can maintain them. I think it would be a good thing. Another thing I would like to talk about is that um, I was actually surprised to see that behavior change got the lowest percentage among the challenges in the countries. Because um, we've in Rwanda we have this RBF program by the World Bank, which which gives stoves to different citizens. There is a subsidy for these stoves, but it's it came up that most of the households um, 
have failed to change their behavior. We are or we are still attached to this culture thing. We are used to cooking using charcoal or firewood. And in some cases, you find that someone is given an improved cooking stove. And after like one month, that person sells it or um, just keeps it and goes back to using charcoal or firewood. So I, I was thinking this will get some good percentage, but I think the experience here is different from other countries. So yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, thank you for also highlighting the importance of uh, empowering the communities to be able to understand these technologies and also to also service, uh, to also construct to be part and part to be part and parcel of the initiative. Not only the end users as well. So much appreciate for your uh, sentiments. Then we are going to move on to the second panel in case you're just joining us from wherever you're joining us from and please let us know in the chat box where you're joining us from the topic is clean cooking for all and we are hearing from the awardees of the youth for climate uh 2023 uh and the title of the webinar is called in our shoes so we are hearing from their experience uh, their innovations uh, and this platform, uh, we are also going to share also some inputs that came throughout the discussion that took place a few days back. Now, moving on next, we are going to hear from, uh, uh, I'll start by introducing their names, Isaac Chiumia from uh, Malawi. And Isaac is into the uh, pay-as-you-go system, uh, the mini motor store, uh, which is a high-performance store in many ways, I'm sure. Isaac is going to elaborate further why it's a high performance stove in many ways. Then we are also going to hear from uh, Tasvia, uh, who uh, has a project that focuses on empowering women. And also, um, you know, uh, it has two elements. I'm not going to share the elements. Tasvia will do that for us. And Tasvia is from Bangladesh. Then we will hear from Sylvain Obedi. And uh, Sylvain's project mainly focuses on the inclusion of people with disabilities. Like I said, we are leaving no one behind in the discussion. How Sylvain is doing this, we are going to let him explain this to us. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call upon Isaac. Isaac. If you are there, I'm sure we would also want to hear from you uh, and uh, also want to hear much about your initiative. If you can elaborate more about the pay as you go system and why you came up with this initiative. Also let us know why you decide to call it a high performance tool in many ways. Over to you, Isaac, if you're here. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Isaac Chiumi. I am one of the, from Malawi, and I am one of the awardees for the 2020 Youth for Climate uh, Challenge. Um, as uh, Elizabeth has elaborated, that uh, our project mainly focuses on the distribution of the new motor stuff, uh, the improved cook stuff. I mean, one of the improved cook stoves using the pay-as-you-go model. Uh, let me start with uh, explaining what the pay-as-you-go model is all about. Uh, the pay-as-you-go model, a lot of you might be aware of. Uh, you might know it already, uh, especially maybe with the solar energy companies. Uh, it's a financing system that allows uh, end users, uh, particularly consumers, uh, households in Malawi, uh, to pay for the improved cook stoves, uh, in this case, the Mimi Motor stove. Um, and um, they, they pay for these stoves uh, in, in monthly installments. So this, um, this uh, innovation is a game changer, especially because it provides uh, the, uh, that uh, loom for people to have access uh, of the improved cook stoves. So I think our challenge is mostly addressing on, on the first question that you raised on, 
uh, what are the challenges that uh, um, we are facing in, in the clean cooking space? And a lot, a lot of people mentioned that uh, it's particularly on affordability. Uh, so we also have that in mind that here in Malawi, uh, the, this, despite the introduction of many improved cook stoves in Malawi, uh, there's also a challenge of adoption to the stoves, and uh, that challenge is mainly focused on the uh, affordability of the stoves. In, in this case, we are talking about the upfront cost of the stoves. Uh, they are higher, uh, and it's very much difficult for especially middle and um, Lulu households to afford uh, to pay for the stoves at a go. Therefore, here uh, at MS Enterprise, uh, we identified uh, a sales model which has been working with the solar energy. Then we also thought that, okay, maybe if we can also introduce this same system in clean cooking space, maybe it can address the challenge of uh, uh, affordability for the improved cook stoves. So basically, that's what our project is all about. And we distribute, we are focusing on the distribution of the Mimi Motor Stove. And yes, the Mimi Motor Stove is a high performing stove in, in the sense that um, based on the research done by the Mimi Motor Company, the stove uh, is a tier five, is a tier four stove, uh, meaning it, uh, it is in the level of the LPG, uh, the liquefied petroleum gas, uh, when it comes to the uh, energy that it uh, it produces, so uh, in that in that scenario, then uh, the the Mimi motor stove has proved itself to be as clean as the LPG gas. That is, when it uses the biomass pellets, um, uh, it is as clean as the LPG, and it reduces the carbon emissions thereby um, reducing air pollution. So uh, that's the one scenario that you can look at it as a higher performance stove. Another uh, angle is uh, is that um, it saves cost, uh, I mean, uh, fuel cost uh, from with about 60%. So this is a comparison between the traditional cook stoves, uh, the charcoal and the firewood. So when people use the Mimi model stove, there's a reduction of about 60% of the uh, of the fuel cost. So in that also angle, it, it is a higher performing stove. And the last, uh, 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 aspect of it being a higher performing stuff is uh, is that it also uh, reduces carbon emissions uh, with about um, four to five tons uh, when using the Mimi motor as compared to the traditional cook stove. So um, as I said, it's 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 a tier four stove. Therefore, it uh, it compares itself with the uh, petroleum liquefied petroleum gas, which is as clean, and therefore the reduction of about four to five. Uh, tons of carbon emissions per year that is um, um, is putting itself as a higher performing stove. So basically, at MS Enterprise, our project through the uh, the um, the funding that we received from uh, Youth for Climate Change, uh, we are mainly focusing on uh, uh, distributing these stoves at a pay as you go model. Thereby, we are able to somehow uh, uh, reduce the challenge of. Um, uh, affordability of the input cook stocks. I think uh, I would say in a nutshell, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Zikomo, Kwambili. Ah. Thank you. In, um, yeah. It's language I would love to believe. Isaac, yes. I just have a follow-up question. How, in, in a few seconds, how are you working with other stakeholders? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, our stakeholders grouped in, in consumers and also partners. I would say, first of all, uh, in the consumers, uh, we are working with um, um, with communities, particularly my community in Lilongwe. Uh, we are working with women, already existing groups of women, uh, maybe church groups. Uh, there is this uh, financial cash transfer groups in Malawi that are called Banking Konde. Uh, a group of women where they loan each other money. We also use those existing groups, uh, to mobilize the, those groups, and maybe we introduce our systems and we also take them through the uh, more like um, what a demonstration of how our system works. And then uh, those women, we are we onboard them in our system once they agree to the um, um, to the system that we're offering. 
And thereby, we also work with the same women to uh, invite other women to join. And uh, that means that somehow there's an incentive that we are working on that whoever is, becomes an agent for us, the women and also the young people, that is, uh, the, there's an incentive that we are offering. But also, we are working with other service providers uh, like Reply, that the producers of the Bama's pellets, and also Pixas. Uh, so, uh, that's how we are engaging our uh, our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. We really much appreciate. In case you do have questions for Isaac, please make use of the chat box. Uh, we are going to ask the questions at once. Um, yeah, so now moving on to the next speaker, who is Tasfia. Tasfia, I think what we would want to hear from you is why did you decide to focus on gender equitable food security in your project and how does clean cooking play a role in that? If you're here, Tasia, please uh, kindly unmute yourself and... Uh... Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. Um, so why did we focus on gender equitable food security? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that um, especially in vulnerable communities, um, like the ones we have chosen in our country, like Kuruna, which is a coastal region, um, the impacts of climate change are not gender neutral. So um, women and girls often have to face up for the most in these situations and they're disproportionately affected um, due to their roles in their household management um, or caregiving as well. So um, in our project, we recognize this urgent need to empower this marginalized and vulnerable group, particularly um, the women and youth, um, and to show that they're not just a victim or sufferers, but also they can also be the agents of change. So um, by providing them with tools, knowledge, and resources, um, we aim to transform them into uh, resilient leaders in their communities. So through our project, um, we try to promote alternative livelihoods approach for the women and youth um, grounded in climate uh, smart technologies, climate smart agriculture, and also market linkage and definitely improved cooking. Uh, also community sensitizations. Um, so, so one is here, um, such as improved cooking stoves are a game changer in my in my belief, because um, in traditional cooking systems like open fire or rudimentary stoves, um, it causes deforestations, carbon carbon emissions, and all serious health risk, especially for women and children as they have to um, endorse cookings as well. So um, through a recent study, uh, it has been seen that almost uh, 3.4 billion people, which are mostly women, uh, still use traditional, what this does is it creates a indoor air pollution, which affects more than 138 million people. And which is approximately 89% of the population, and especially in the rural areas of, the, of our country. So um, this contributes to about 78,000 uh, premature deaths as well, um, due to the smoke produced by using these uh, fuels in closed spaces. And also it has a huge severe health implications for women and children as well. Um, so by introducing clean cooking technologies, we are tackling multiple challenges at once. For example, uh, first of all, we are reducing the environmental impact of cooking um, by minimizing the need for firewood. And uh, also, we are improving um, public health, uh, which is a leading cause for respiratory illness among the women and children, especially. Um, so, in summary, if I summarize it, uh, our decision to focus on gender equitable food security in our it stems from our commitment um, um, for inclusivity, empowerment, and um, definitely sustainability. And clean cooking technologies are, are not just tools, I believe they're the catalyst of transformational change. 
And um, by harnessing this power of innovation and community engagement, definitely in this case, we aim not only to adopt to challenges of climate change, but also build a more resilient and equitable future for a platform or a chance to create agency among themselves. So uh, especially I would like to give UNDP and the um, of Italy for reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tassi. I much appreciate it. Unfortunately, I think I might have been some parts of your presentation due to uh, network connections, but uh, it's fine. We managed to hear the most important parts. So thank you so much uh, for any follow-up question. I'll, I'll I'm so sorry for that. No, it's okay. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. We had the most important parts. So thank you so much. We really do appreciate and congratulations for the amazing work that you're doing in Bangladesh. So next, I'm going to call upon Sylvain. Uh, Sylvain Obedi is from uh, DRC, and uh, he has done quite a number of initiatives ensuring that, you know, even the disabilities are engaged in this uh, climate crisis. Sylvain, you play a role in promoting inclusion through involving individuals with disabilities in environmental education and advocating for clean cooking. Could you provide further details about these initiatives and highlight the challenges you have encountered? Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. And I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Uh, only uh, I have a problem with my camera. I can't use it, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Uh, uh, yes, uh, because um, we are con convinced that uh, persons with disability have a role to play in the fight of against climate change and uh, in the mitigation of the effect of climate change on vulnerable communities. We do not limit ourselves to advocate, uh, but we educate uh, in order to train people with disability who are part of the solution because the effect of climate change do not choose uh, the disability. Our initiative of uh, clean cooking, which we really appreciate the effort of uh, or the support from the uh, the Youth for Climate, uh, the UNDP initiative, is uh, the initiative which consists of collecting biodegradable uh, food waste and that we trans transmit it into ecologic briquette. And this is to limit the, the, the human pressure uh, on the forest, but also to give uh, the household of person with disability access to renewable energy in cooking in order to contribute to the reduction of malnutrition among the house of, uh, house of, uh, household of the person with disability. This initiative uh, is uh, also the kind of helping them uh, to see how they can be re uh, resilient uh, with the climate action, with climate change, uh, uh, I'm sorry. And uh, the, 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 the challenge which we are facing are, are so many. And uh, firstly, to arrive to have uh, this um, uh, this waste uh, from oh, oh, this west uh, west food uh, to ecologic briquettes, it's it it asked many things. It means we may pass by collecting, we may pass by choosing what is biodegradable, which is not biodegradable. We have also to put it to the uh, outside, so then it can have the possibility to share. So 
the problem which we have, it means so because of climate uh, uh, change, the season or the it, it, it's not again respectable. It means the calendar which we may have and see in this this uh this period it will be rain period or this period it will not be a rain period. For now, it's it 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 is not respect that that situation and it is the first difficulty which we have. The 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 second difficulty which we have it's all this production which we are doing we are doing it manually. It means we are having machine which are not working with electricity which are only manual machine and they are. This, this this kind of work is doing by person with disability it means they really don't have much uh physical effort to do this work it's it's having an impact to uh to the production which we are having it means we are do not being able to protect to produce uh much ecologic briquettes because uh, of its asking effort uh physical effort it means that is a uh, the challenge which we are having. And another challenge, even we are do not predicting much. So uh, the, the house of person with disability, they still, they started to use the prediction which they are having. But the problem is to be able, uh, because the objective is it's not only for their own uh, using, I mean their own cooking, but how this can help them also to be resilient uh with the climate action it means how they can be selling part of their production so until now uh the communities who are using uh who are coming from uh the charbo which are coming in the forest who still using this and the uh, those one who come uh, who are in the transition from the charbo of the the forest and uh, to to the briquette ecologic are not uh, many. It means we still uh, having the problem of uh, having the support or having those one who can buy what they are producing. So uh, for mitigating this, we are continuing to do uh, the uh, the sensibilization to have more uh, uh, communities who are using the, the ecologic briquette. So that's uh, are trying to, 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 so then they can get support. And for the problem, which is uh, for the physical effort, which is have a, an impact to the prediction, we are sensibilizing now the family of person with disability who uh, may do not have a disability to support their friend, their uh, their family members who are having disability and who are in this initiative to support them. So then we can see how we can increase uh, our prediction. So uh, this is uh, uh, what we are doing, uh, what we expect, and how uh, we are trying to be also part of the solution in terms of staying and. Uh, asking everything being done for us uh, and then we are trying also to be part of the, the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And I like the way that you are using a whole community approach, especially when you mentioned how you are engaging uh, members of a representative with disability. Maybe just to hear from you, how has been the response? Uh, are people uh, coming on board with this uh, or there has been some resistance? Yeah, uh, firstly, there is no, there is no, res uh, there is no resistance because the, the, the charbo is so, uh, is, is is so expensive. It means it's 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 not uh uh easy to access for those vulnerable communities who do not have money uh, for buying it. And once we came with uh, the initiative to tell them what you are producing here, you can eat uh patat douce, and so you are going to put out 
uh, those things which you 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 have in before eating. So all these which you are you are trying to to put out or to do not use can help you uh, to have energy and to cook because sometimes uh, before people were obliged to eat only some kind of uh, of of some, some kind of of food and mostly the food which is not taken long on uh, uh, when it is been cooking it means they can't eat it it's like br uh, brains or beans even if they want to eat beans they can't because they don't have access to uh, to to the energy with the charbo they may only buy for cooking uh, the small thing which not they take much time on the cookings but this was going with them in malnutrition so now once they they learn how to to fabric uh, for themselves their the energy which they are using the rest of their cooking uh, waste cooking so it's like uh, 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 they they took that initiative like a very good thing which arrived for them and again they are they may produce for their cooking and also they can produce if they produce much they can also sell to get in some uh, something which can be helping them so the initiative it's uh, really very good uh, appreciated in, in the community and only those uh, uh, challenges which we are facing as i was saying and we are trying to to see how uh, to resolve this that is the, the the problem but the only challenge which is difficult for us and which is out of our control it's the the periodicity of raining period and uh, and raining period and for that i think we will continue to observe how the situation is going and do not again stay on our programmation on our programmatic uh, to do thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia, and much appreciate. And now I'm just going to look at the chat and see the questions that you have asked. Uh, Grace, I think there are some responses from Daniel and uh, Godwin concerning uh, behavioral change, if you can check them out. I'm not going to reach them. Uh, because they are not questions per se, but responses. Then also, I think there are some. There is a question uh, from Mark, uh, who says, "I would like to find out from other participants who are into biogas energy. How do they make their money and tips for? And how do they make their money and share some tips for entering the market? So, uh, if any of the uh, panelists would love to respond. Uh, then another question uh, is from Chiso, who says, this is a question for Isaac. What is your target population? Is it rural or urban? The availability of the main cooking stove to all the districts in Malawi. Uh, then also... Uh, do we have more questions here? I don't think we have any questions anymore. Uh, but also if Isaac would want to respond and just to remind you all that Roxani shared a question and uh, she asked, how can we engage women in the design, implementation and monitoring of clean cooking solutions? So your contributions are much appreciated to the question that has been shared. Uh, Isaac, uh, would you want to respond to the question that has been asked? Yeah, um, so uh, the target here in Malawi is, uh, we're looking at the uh, uh, low and middle income households, particularly those who are living in urban and very urban, uh, areas of Malawi and our focus for now, our pilot is in Lilongwe. However, we are looking at uh, the inclusion of even rural uh, as the system proves to be effective and we 
we plan to expand even to uh, rural communities. But for a start now, our focus, our target is that is people living in the peri-urban and the urban uh, cities of Lilongwe. Um, uh, the second uh, question on availability, yeah, the availability of course is also dependent on, uh, uh, on the capacity of our organization in terms of finance, uh, how we can, how much we can procure and how much we can distribute. But however, yes, uh, so long as we have that uh, capacity, uh, there is the availability of the stuff. We're in touch with the suppliers from Netherlands, but also we have other local uh, service providers who are, with, who we are working with and have the stoves in their inventory. Uh, so uh, I would say, yes, the availability for other districts in Malawi is there but it's mainly also depending, especially for our organization, it's also depending on the, our financial capacity. So well, that's what I would respond. And maybe just to mention what, uh, to also just uh, comment on the question from Oksan, I think the inclusion of women uh, from our side, we are looking at it as them also being part of our system that they become our, maybe our agents to help us distribute uh, the stuffs that way, you know, like, uh, most people have mentioned that uh, cooking is mostly attached to women. Uh, therefore, if they see other women uh, uh, mentioning about the mini motor stuff, the employed cook stuffs, I think it's easier for other women to join. That way, we are also touching the, um, the, the aspect of behavior change that, you know, uh, it's easier maybe for a woman to convince another woman to adapt to improved cook stuffs. So, yeah, I think that's one way we are dealing with that uh, with our organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Much appreciate. Omar, if you're here, would you like to respond to the question on biogas? There is a question that I read out. The question reads, I would like to find out from other participants who are into biogas energy. Of course, you are not a participant, but your experience is much appreciated. How do they make their money and any tips for entering into the market? Um, if you are comfortable to respond to it, uh, you can unmute yourself or you can use the chat box. Would so much appreciate. Thank you so much all for the questions. It has been quite interactive. I'm going to call upon uh, Grace and Lulu if you have any reflections on what has been shared so far. Sure, um, I, can, I guess I can start. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you so much. Um, I think this has been a very uh, rich discussion and so many insights. I've just been enjoying looking at the chat and all the comments that have been coming in. Um, I think in addition, maybe just a, a reflection as we wrap up, um, in addition to the issues around affordability and awareness, I think what we really need to push for in clean cooking is the funding into the sector, um, which is quite minimal when you look at other sectors, even you know, you know programming around electricity access. Um, clean cooking is never really considered as a key part of energy kind of uh, uh, programming and planning and also for fundraising. So um, I would also just encourage uh, all of you to continue the work, um, obviously with the panelists in this discussion, but all of you that are working on the ground to continue this work and to fight for more funding into the sector and where public resources are available, you know, making sure that those public resources, you know, focus on this capacity building, awareness raising, um, and, you know, deployment of business models that are innovative, similar to the one um, that Isaac, for example, is pushing in Malawi. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important to kind of elevate the discussions around the integrated nature of the cooking transition. And I think, uh, Tasfia actually said it nicely that, you know, clean cooking technologies are a catalyst for transformative change. I think that was a really nice thing that she said, and it's so true. And so if we can elevate this at the policy level to make sure that the policymakers really consider um, these integrated dimensions and making sure that the ministries of energy, of gender, of nature, biodiversity are talking to each other, um, this is really how we'll, we'll also make the change that we want to see on the ground. So thank you so much and uh, really looking forward to continuing this discussion even after today's session. Over.
Thank you so much, Lulu. We really do appreciate your inputs and your, your remarks, and also for staying with us throughout the session. Uh, Grace, uh, over to you if you have any reflections to share. Yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you very much, Lulu. Um, since we are all a bit over time, I will just add one thing. Um, I would suggest that uh, we mainstream gender throughout the value chain of these clean cook cook stoves and try to always um, make sure that women are always included in each and every step. And then um, if we can always share the evidence on gender and empowerment widely throughout the entire energy sector, it would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grace. We do appreciate uh, your valuable inputs and uh, thank you for staying with us throughout the session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for dedicating time to join us in this discussion. We had dedicated one hour, 30 minutes, but as you can see, it's still heating up. We want to ask more questions. We want to contribute more. But unfortunately, we also do understand that you are quite busy people and you need uh, to return and attend to other issues besides clean cooking initiatives. We just want to thank you so much for the time that you have taken to interact and engage with us. And also just to flag that the discussion on the Y4C platform will continue. I have seen some people have started joining. We do much appreciate the links will be put in the chat box. Please let's continue the discussion on the, uh, on the Y4C platform. And also uh, please do not forget to join us on this platform each and every month. This is just the beginning. This is just the first of so many episodes. We are going to hear a lot of information from amazing young people who are doing so much around the world in tackling uh, climate related issues. So without saying much, I think this marks the end of our session. And uh, a big thank you to everyone, please. Join us again in April uh, as we'll be focusing on uh, another topic. Thank you so much.